Salutations, Celestial Sightseers. I'm David Fuller from Eyes on the Sky. The Sky and Viewing Options tab is one of the most used functions when you use the program Stellarium. You just go over here to the left side of your screen and uh, this third from the top icon, you can see it says Sky and Viewing Options. You can also press F4 on your keyboard on your keyboard to be able to open that up. So when we open up that window, it usually opens up in the center, but I've got it over here on the right-hand side. There's a number of different functions, and we're just going to really focus on this Sky tab for now in this video. There's a lot of functionality here that can change how you view Stellarium and how it displays on your screen to make your user experience uh, more to your liking. So the first thing that we can do is we can change the absolute scale of stars. And what that does is it just shows the size of the stars that are rendered by Stellarium. Um, increasing this makes uh, the stars appear larger than before. You can see how they all kind of go up when I hit uh, when I go up this way. You can also go down below the value of one. That makes all the stars uh, appear even smaller. That's actually a useful function when you go in to look at a double star very close uh, because the stars may be too large in absolute scale. So if you reduce that absolute scale for two very close together double stars, you'll be able to see them more easily. For example, the uh, double double star in Lyra is a good example of that. Now the relative scale changes the relative scale of the stars based on their brightness. So the difference in size of bright stars compared to faint stars changes. So as we go larger, we get this uh, really large, for example, Arcturus right here looks uh, incredibly huge. Uh, and as we go smaller, that's going to change the stars so that they all appear more the same size, uh, particularly as we go below that one value. Uh, we can also do some really crazy things. Uh, we can uh, bring the relative scale up in addition to the absolute scale so we can... Um, make the sky look really strange. Uh, that's usually not the way we want to do things, but there may be uh, situations where you want to create a star chart or something else and show some stars in a very bright context. And that's the way that you would be able to do that. Uh, normally, you're just going to want to keep these around the one values uh, as that's normally a, a pretty good rendering of how the sky would look. Now, another option that we have is to change the Milky Way brightness. The Milky Way is actually over here in this side of the screen for this particular time. Uh, this is going to be uh, an August view of the sky from my latitude of 40 degrees north latitude. You can then uh, increase that value and make the Milky Way look a lot brighter. Now I certainly don't see it this bright in the night sky, but at least it gives you kind of uh, an idea of where the brighter sections are. So if you want to look in those particular sections with binoculars or a telescope and sweep through those areas, you'll be able to see a lot more stars in those locations as opposed to some of the darker sections where there's maybe more dust blocking the visibility of our galaxy uh, on edge there. Uh, very often just leaving it around that two, uh, one or two function is, is likely going to give you a, a pretty good uh, view of what you may typically see even from um, fairly dark locations uh, unless you're at a really 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 great uh, viewing spot uh, maybe in the western United States or, or some other uh, areas of the world where you've got a, a great view of the Milky Way. The next option that we can look at is the twinkle and that will really come in handy if you're doing something like I'm doing where uh, you have some um, you're doing a screen capture. You can see how as I increase that value, the stars start to twinkle. It sort of gives the idea of what the atmosphere would do if it's the atmosphere is very unsteady. Uh, you can see how some of the dimmer stars almost become invisible. Some of the brighter ones look to be winking in and out. We can drop that back down. The nice thing about this is we also turn it off entirely and then just get a static view of the sky if you want to. The last one that we look at in this stars box is the dynamic eye adaptation. And I actually don't think this works like it used to. Uh, I think really the atmosphere then becomes the one that works more accurately on this. We can go to the moon here and I can give you an idea of what this does. It really helps you see what um, dimmer stars would do around a bright object. So for example, we've got the atmosphere. If we turn the atmosphere off, all of a sudden we can see, oh gosh, we've got this other bright, uh, this other star here, another star here, another star there. Uh, the dynamic eye adaptation doesn't change that. The atmosphere, however, does. 
really dim those dimmer stars. You can maybe see some of the brighter ones that are, st are still nearby. The so the atmosphere really helps that happen. Uh, this will also work when you are when you have Jupiter near some dim stars or, or even Saturn, Venus, or uh, perhaps Mars. So that's a, a useful function sometimes when you want to see if you're going to be able to see a dimmer object in the, the sky near something that's brighter. Some of our other options are we can look at the light pollution. Uh, you can take the light pollution from the locations database or you can just manually change it. You take this back off, you can actually increase light pollution. So you may have a, a sky that looks very much like this where you're really only going to see something like Arcturus and Saturn and, and perhaps Antares. Uh, we can then back that off. Uh, down to one and get a really good look at what the night sky would look at from a, a truly dark sky location. Uh, you can then set this to at least approximate the view that you see from where you are and uh, it gives a, a lot better rendering of uh, how you'll see things when you do go outside and say okay I know I can see stars down to this magnitude or this is approximately what I see. Just sort of set that to uh, give you a good idea of what you can expect when you actually go outside and look at things or if you have a laptop as you're looking at the night sky uh, in real time. Now the shooting stars, uh, it gives a ZHR, that's the zenithal hourly rate. That would be how often you would expect to see a meteor pass overhead uh, through the atmosphere at some direction, just uh, generally speaking. You can change that rate to something very high. You can change it to zero. It's really more useful if you're trying to understand where the Perseids are coming from. You can really bump up those rates uh, into the 1,000 or 10,000 views and uh, see the, kind of the radiant, the location of where meteors would be coming from. Over here in the planets and satellites, we can show where the planets uh, will be. So let's see, we can either, and this also takes off the moon uh, and other minor planets like the asteroids. So we can either show the moon and Saturn or just take them out entirely. If we only want to look at where stars are in the night sky, usually I just leave the planets up. We can also have a show planets markers that just puts a little circle around what planets and the moons are. Uh, that way you can identify them. If you do, for example, uh, turn off this um, particular uh, check mark, you can now know, um, actually, I guess it looks like you have to have that on in order to have the circle on there. I didn't know that. I don't use this very often, but that is a way to be able to show the planet markers so that you know that that's a planet as opposed to a star. Showing the planet's orbits is rather interesting. Uh, it's going to show generally uh, the line in the sky that is similar to the ecliptic where the planets go along. Now I'm going to back up a little bit in time here because what we can do is actually see where uh, Mercury... Oh no, it's only going to show it to me uh, when it's dark enough. Um, but you can see Mercury here. Uh, let's see if we can... Pull Mercury up a little bit uh, in the sky so you can see where Mercury's at. Uh, there we show Mercury's uh, it, where its orbit is. And that's a, an interesting one because instead of it going all the way across the sky like planets outside of Earth's orbit, uh, Mercury and Venus will only uh, kind of go up and down. Uh, Venus will have a much higher loop where it goes up. But that uh, is helpful for planning when you might be able to see Mercury best uh, as far as what day. And you can really get a, a sense of where it might be if it's going to be near another bright object or star in the, in the sky. Let's go ahead and zoom back into a later time frame. And uh, we'll take off the planet's orbits. Uh, I honestly don't know what simulate light speed does. Uh, I've never actually used that function. Uh, I imagine it, it does something useful uh, for simulating light speed, but I, I don't find that useful at all. Scale moon is a good one because uh, as we bring the moon uh, into view, there's the moon. Uh, when you click on that, you can actually make the moon appear larger or smaller. So uh, clicking on this function, we can actually increase the, si the relative size of the moon rather significantly all the way up to 20 if you want to. Uh, this is good if you're trying to show where the moon is in relation to other things in the sky and you want to take a, a screenshot or do uh, another kind of graphic of some kind. Generally though, uh, I just leave it small or, or somewhere down in, in the two, uh, 2 2.1 range uh, because that really is uh, about where I would uh, at most want to have the moon 
appear. Um, but it, when you when you have a zoomed out look of, of the sky, sometimes increasing the scale moon can be beneficial. Auto select landscapes. Uh, honestly, I don't know what that does, uh, but you can select landscapes uh, manually, and I will show that in another video on how to be able to do that. That's not a, a, a terribly useful function. Uh, I'm not sure actually why it's in this particular tab, uh, as I, I don't use that very often. Now, the stars and label markers, these are sliders, so you can actually show uh, what particular stars are visible in the sky and how many of them actually display the name. So you can really turn this all the way down by moving it to the right. You can really push up what stars are visible and, and what the names are. Um, I, I usually leave this somewhere in the middle, although there are times when I want to see more star names, and that's a good thing. Uh, oftentimes when you use the constellation line functions, you can uh, then see which stars are which uh, of a given constellation with a more zoomed out type of view in the sky. DSOs is very helpful because this is going to show you where uh, deep sky objects are. That's what DSO stands for, is deep sky objects. So anything that's a star cluster, a nebula, these are what are going to show up when you really move this slider over. Those are also going to increase as you zoom in. You will see more of them as you zoom into a particular area of sky. So you don't necessarily always need to uh, push that all the way over. As you can see, it gets very busy with information all the way to the right in that section. Uh, somewhere in the middle or, or even towards the left is uh, very often the most useful because those will show the brightest objects that are there. And as you move it more to the right, you get dimmer objects. Planets is a, a useful one to be able to use when there are things such as asteroids visible. We don't have any in this particular view, but uh, the more you turn that to the right, the more you're gonna, uh, it's gonna show up Things like Uranus or Neptune or even some of the fainter minor planets such as Ceres or Vesta. And uh, you can also dial that back down if you really just want a naked eye view as well. You can also, of course, uh, click any of these to turn any of those on or off with the checkmark systems. Now the limit magnitudes one is uh, quite useful because you can either go all the way to what you might see at a dark sky site at 6.5 magnitude, or most of us have, see less than that in the night sky, so we can actually dial that down. I usually see somewhere around 4.5 to uh, 5.0 magnitude sky, so I will often leave this at 4.7 or 4.8. That really gives me a very similar view in Stellarium to what I will be able to see outside. You can also do the same with deep sky objects, and that may be useful for what you want to be able to see with binoculars. You can then say, okay, let's limit this to only deep sky objects that are, say, 8th magnitude or ninth magnitude. Maybe that's all that you would be able to see with a pair of binoculars. So then you can change that functionality. This is a really uh, great portion of the Stellarium functionality that's uh, used very often. I would encourage you to, to take a look at those and, and see what you can do to match the functions that are on here with what you see in your sky. And that way you'll best be able to compare what you see in Stellarium with what you see when you actually go out and look at the cosmos. That's all for this particular video. Keep your eyes in the sky and your outdoor lights aimed down so we can all see what's up. I'm David Fuller, wishing you clear and dark skies.